Boo Boo Shemi. Steve Buscemi, friend of the show. A friend of the show. What a treat. We got to know him. We meaning me and myself and I and David. Got mm. to hang out with him a lot at the uh, in Washington, D.C. for the Sandler Mark Twain Award. And so we sang songs together. We hung out. Uh, couldn't be a nicer guy. Uh, one of our great... Uh, um, I don't know, he's just been around a long time. It, when Steve Buscemi is in a movie, you're always happy. David? <laughs> yeah. First of all, he's a very uh, interesting dude. He's very earnest. He jokes around, but he's got a very quiet coolness to him. He goes back to from right, right when he hit the scene that he's always had such a attention scene-stealing look, and, and, he, and he backs it up with great acting. He's just, he's a great guy to have around. He's in a lot of Sandler stuff, and I sort of, met him through the Sandler verse. And then uh, I just see him at different mm -hmm. events, that old happy Madison party. And so we've gotten to where we can shoot the shit. And uh, it was a great time with him. Glad he did it. Yeah. The, um, he's done movies with the Coen brothers. Mm -hmm. um, kind of Fargo was the one that I think got him incredibly noticed. We talk about that movie. Yeah. And, and then he, he's directing a new movie. It's the second directing effort in 10 years. And uh, he, he goes into that very interesting. Uh, he'll tell you all about that, which is fun. And he's just a nice, humble guy. He just has um, and a great sense of humor. Yeah, we try to get him out of his shell and crack up. And uh, we, all, we always have fun. Guys like that who are just innately uh, cool dudes. And he's got a very good funny bone. So he liked it. We cracked up. Mm -hmm. I cracked up. Yeah. Without further ado, click play and then hear a commercial. When I did Grown Ups, uh, oh my God, a few people remember. I heard some <laughs> Um Well, you were in Grown Ups, but the one I was in that, I don't know if you, this was the one. You were in the cast. Which one is that? Is that both of them or is that? I was in both of them, yeah. Okay, yeah. So, <laughs> so the one where, but Dana, this is boring as fucking shit, but I me and Steve will crack up. <laughs> You're already mesmerized? That's good. Okay. So we're doing a drunk, a scene where we're all around and it's nighttime and, and uh, we're all drinking and the couples start to pair off and slow dance. And this Joe Walsh song comes on or something. And I, uh, or not Joe Walsh, but sentimental lady. And I go, Oh no. Um, oh, this is a good song. And I, and I'm drunk and I get up, and I sort of stumble around and then I interrupt Adam and Selma and then I wind up falling down drunk. But it's a seven page scene and we're all in it. So it's hard to shoot. So we shoot it all night one night and we get to my coverage and they go, it's getting light. We'll pick that up another time. And I'm like, another Aww. time? Because I just had it all memorized because I'm doing it all night. I'm like, I'm kind of glad I'm last because I have a lot of lines. So Damn. three weeks later, McCartney is playing in Boston. We're pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> we might be in swamp squat. Oh, so, shoo, 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 shoo. I just do. Yeah. McCartney sounds. Yes. <laughs> sounds like, oh, Perfect. I thought he was here. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking around. When did, did he jump on? <laughs> so I go, I, Chris Rock uh, is in the movie. And I say, Chris McCartney's in Boston tonight. And he goes, his ticket lady was my third grade teacher. And I said, oh my God. And he goes, let's call her right now and he goes we're all dialed in i said we're done around six seven we haul ass we found exactly when he goes on and then he goes and he wants to say hi right before we're like oh my god wow so about right before the end of the day it was maybe jack or someone came into my trailer and goes we're gonna pick yours up tonight i go oh, god. pick up my what and they go remember <laughs> jack that Hi, yeah, Jack. <laughs> remember that scene you didn't finish? I'm like, like it's my fault. I go, yeah, I didn't finish it right. And he goes, I think tonight's a good night. I go, no, it's not. It's fucking Paul so McCartney. You're just not a worker. You know, you're not a real worker. <laughs> Paul McCartney waited till midnight to go on. He's like, are they coming? God, so, he's 81 and he's up yeah. half the night. <laughs> yeah. So I go, keep I go keep in, Steve, waiting. and then they go, I said, do not bring that fucking cast in to do all their shit again. I go, I'll do it. I said, I can't do that to them. So they gladly all scrammed. And then it was Sandler, you know, he's overseeing it. And then um, I'm doing it to, you know, a bunch of like tennis balls or whatever, the eye lines. And I do my whole seven pages. I'm drunk. And so I come to Video Village. This is sort of the point of the story. Yeah. And uh, I can't wait. 
and I'm like, like Adam, like we got it. And uh, yes, I haven't taken any classes, but yes, I'm really good. And I sit there and he's just looking at it going, uh, uh. and I go, we watch the playback and I'm behind him kind of chuckling like this is working. And then he goes, were you drunker last time? Were you, was oh. it a little, it was a little Whoops. different. I don't know if it's matching. And I'm like, so I go, play me back something from the last time, you know? And I was, and uh -oh. so we were, we're trying to go, okay. And it was really hard to match the exact tone of the drunkenness. Sounds crazy, but I go, I'm going to go under on this one. And then I come back and then I go, okay, I'm going to go a little bigger. And we did it until it made mm -hmm. sense. Now, when you see the movie, you don't even notice, but it kind of fits oh, in. Oh, you, you notice. I noticed when I saw it. <laughs> that you go, he's medium. <laughs> David plus is drunk. a little drunker in this line. Yeah. 30 seconds later, he's slightly less drunk. Just, come, just come. play it six and a half Tito's and Diet Cokes. And I'm like, ooh, that's a big one. Okay, I can play that. And then, um, so that just shows you, first of all, Adam's eye is always on the ball. Yes. And, and little things like that matter and it's you can't tell yourself when you're acting and you need someone else's eyes to go it was good i just don't think it's exactly what we had and, and it, mm -hmm. so it took a little bit of a collabing right there and then that's kind of fun when you finish and you feel like you got it right and everyone goes got it and then you all go home and you go got it got it and you just knock it out i have two questions for you mm -hmm. did you make it to the concert not a fucking chance it was no. until 2 a.m we did that all right well, I guess my second question is not a question. It's, uh, it's a comment about Adam because I agree with you. He's always so involved in like, you know, all the, all the films. And I said to him, why don't, why don't you ever direct? You yeah. Know, I said, and he said he did, doesn't want a location scout. Like that was the extra, reason. extra work. Yeah. That was the reason. He, he, he works morning, noon, and night anyway. Yeah, I mean, he's, yeah. there's block, he's re-blocking. He's doing things that, yeah. directors all do so yeah i think he's listened to so much anyway and it's sort of just uh you know uh given that he's going to have a lot of say but uh i guess you're right it's that extra well it's a around. little bit like saturday night live if you write a sketch you're sort of the de facto director we had davy wilson he's setting up shots he's he's got just it's live so that it's not you, but you're still kind of the boss of your sketch. You're the producer and the director. If yeah. you wrote it, you're casting mm -hmm. it with other cast members. And Sandler is like that. He's like a co co director. I mean, yeah. he's sort of everyone knows he's the overarching creative force. He's got his eye on every ball. So um, I think the way he did it was brilliant. You know, I don't think anybody else in history has done that many movies where they are in a sense, an auteur. Right. It, it is Adam, you know, and, uh, he puts his know. stamp. I mean, definitely yeah. when, when he, he, the fact that he actually cares and even when we're doing movies where you think this will probably not get good reviews just because they have a sort of bias, he still puts <laughs> everything into it and really cares. I mean, another grown up story is, do you have a half hour? Is, um, <laughs> we'll I, get, we'll no, get to you in a minute. Steve. No, Steve. <laughs> the listener my, is out March 29th. I'm just going to real question. That's all I wanted. Everyone yeah. just jump off March now. 29th. If you want a great ride in a movie theater, a sophisticated adult drama, beautifully done by Steve Boshimi. Boom. Your publicist now, right now is actually having a glass of champagne, even if they they're in AA. Right. <laughs> they go, Steve, you can check out for the rest of this. Right. And now David's paid. So now we're going to David. For I want to ask Steven, when did he get fitted for the full body cast? And <laughs> what was his reaction to going? Wait, what do I do here? Or do you oh. see it in the script and go, uh oh? Yeah, I, I could tell I was <laughs> Yeah. In that one. <laughs> Even on the day, like, because I remember, and, and the whole cast was there, you know, because it's like one of the big scenes. And it was, and it started to rain. And they got the scene, and then everybody just scatters. I thought, these are like, I thought we were friends. Like are we <laughs> you're left out there. In the room. Nobody's checking on me. Like everybody just like. <laughs> and, and then uh, the AD, you know, and then I thought I was done. And the AD said, well, uh, I think they want to get a shot where the dog comes up and sniffs your balls. <laughs> and I actually got mad. I went, are you fucking kidding me? Huh? <laughs> 
<laughs> are your are your real hands in the real sticking straight up like goalpost, or do they put fake hands in there so you don't have they to put fake hands? In Thank it. you, no, God. I couldn't move. Thank I couldn't. you, Jesus. <laughs> I thought it was real until right now. I just went, mm-hmm. wait a second. Could you hold your hands up all day? Because also the thing about it, when you're like that, like if I was seen like that, I go, well, obviously they're going to shoot me out first. And no one even gives a fat fuck. They're like, nope. Oh, Bushemi, we never picked up. We'll get him at the end. Just sit there in the rain. We'll come to you while you're rotting <laughs> and getting rusty. <laughs> yeah, it is tough. Movies are so complex, and especially growing up, so you got 55 leads. Oh, my God. There's so many people, yeah, that are on set. And I, I don't know how the producers and the ADs do it, but they somehow manage. And just just for the people, young people listening that are yeah. in the groundlings or whatever and aspiring to have mm-hmm. a career in television or movies, <laughs> we understand these are first world problems. Sure, stupid. <laughs> but but um, th- the thing is, you're on a movie set. I would say the most tired I'd, I ever been, I was because it was a, one of those 21 hour days. And they said, okay, Garth's going to go in the diner. I'm going to do this thing I worked on for weeks, this dance. And I'm going, and I was young and fit. I go, I am as tired as I've ever been in my life. I've been up like 40 hours and here's your shot for eternity. Go for it. Oh, at the very end of the night, they get you. Yeah. Well, that's with Steve's film. I'm assuming like Woody Allen would do like night shoots would end at eight o'clock. Let's say, you know, I think we should get some Chinese, you know, did you, uh, were you able to have civilized hours in a sense for the listener March 29th? Pretty Thompson. (laughs) Pretty much. Um, <laughs> but we know we wanted to, we, we knew we had nighttime shots so that we, uh, by the end of the week, we were going to be uh, shooting outside. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we started at the beginning of the week, normal hours, and then each day we would ju- just start a little bit later. By the end of the week, it was it was night shoots. Go into splits, lingo, lingo. Go into splits. You know, I wasn't going to say splits. Yeah, splits wanna... is lingo, and I want the people want to hear it. First of all, we were watching your uh, movie this morning. Uh, this is The Listener, right, Dana? The Listener is a heavy film. Uh, it's very, very interesting, the conceit of it, this this volunteer helpline woman. Uh, I mean, we'll talk to a minute. It is your movie <laughs> that Steve directed. It's very, it's compelling, it, and it, it just kind of captures the angst, uh, post-pandemic angst, or just human angst uh, and sadness. It's it's extremely well done and well acted uh, by Tessa Thompson, who is the only actor in the film. You go ahead, Steve. Well, she's the, she's the only actor that we see in the film. Right. Thank yes. you. Thank There's an amazing cast of callers. Yeah, she plays a home helpline worker. She works the night shift. She works from home, and um, she gets all these calls during the night that she navigates and uh and we have a wonderful cast that of the callers but you only hear their voices but you uh, and you only see tessa on screen for the duration of the film and she's amazing because they are characters also and they uh i was watching with someone and the first guy that called in she was more into the guy she was like i like his voice i like his tone i like what he's saying I like this guy. And so it's actually a big challenge to be a voice and to have any sort of resonance or impact. And Tessa is obviously great on her end. She's got a very calm, soothing uh, voice. And she's, you know, she could get very riled. And it seems she's got a very, uh, you have to, to have that sort of job. That's what her whole job is. And uh, very interesting. I think what she worked with was, you know, because we did everything we could to make it cinematic. You know, if this mm-hmm. was pre-pandemic and she was at a call center where she was, you know, kind of tethered to a desk, I don't know how I would have made made that film. But because mm-hmm. she is, a, is able to work at home, we purposefully found a location that had a nice flow to it that she could walk around, be in different rooms, go outside. And uh, yeah, what's amazing about Tessa is that yeah, her voice was, you know, she always tried to keep, you know, like a calm level tone, but then, mm-hmm. but you could see on her face, if she sure. was upset about something that somebody said or worried, um, yeah, she had a, a lot of these 
uh, micro expressions uh, that, you know, sort of gave you an inkling of, of what she was going through herself. And you know what you really captured, which you do a lot when you're young anyway, where you'll like a girl or something, and then you'll talk on the phone at night. It's very intimate. It's ca- And these two people, yeah. Tess's character and the strangers calling in, they don't know each other. It's very dim. It's the middle of the night, and they're having this intimate conversation, and the voice actors immediately the first one just sounded very just extremely real <laughs> like you're eavesdropping yeah. you know you captured that so thank you thank you so much i appreciate you guys watching it yeah uh I, you know the voices uh first of all i kind of want to ask you one other question but about this but when i was on the phone as a kid or dating or doing anything in life the voice was kind of a fingerprint so when i think of women i've dated in the past or present a voice is one thing I really appreciate in people because they are fingerprints. It's so unique. And you, I think I was brainwashed growing up, like trying to talk to girls on the phone and talking for hours with somebody you liked. And you always remember that. And sometimes people get older and everything, but you know their voice right away. Right. And so when I go into 7-Eleven and if I ask for something, they go, oh, I was waiting to hear you talk. That is you. <laughs> yeah, so, right. you know, it's kind of interesting. So when you have people call in, it's very powerful to have the right, person with the right because you have to make them all a little different and that's true yeah yeah that's a trick and then you have to make for people that don't know that sort of uh indie uh budget is like if you have one location what you were saying is you have to use some trickery and some movements and some things to keep it alive and you did that and that's the hard part with one subject and one um location it's it's in a, it's less expensive but it's very it's hard to keep it going so to make a good movie is tough we also we also shot the movie in six days because Whoa. Tessa was still working on Westworld, the HBO show that oh okay, did, and that was her hiatus. She had seven days off, and she chose to work with us. You know, we were trying to find a window, and she's so busy um, with other films and other things. But she had that one week off, so we shot the entire film in that one week, which was doable because. It is a confined space and one actor, but still, it was it was it was a bit of a challenge. And another Not interesting for uh, layer frequency. I don't know. I didn't. I went to state school. Um, <laughs> is this idea when you take on a role, like when you see a teacher outside of school, you go, "They're just normal. What are they doing?" So right. in this case, her character mm. is, has her own issues, and yet she's in the helper mode. It's like when you have a therapist. And you kind of wonder what's going on with them, <laughs> you know? So that was a whole nother layer to the film that the people don't, you know, she's just in the helper mode and then she's in that mode, but she had so many other issues herself. So, yeah. I mean, I think most of the people who do that work have been through it themselves. Mm-hmm. And part of the conceit of the film is that Tessa's character, she breaks protocol because you're not really supposed to, tell you know your personal story Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. callers but she does so for this one call where this woman is in crisis and um she reveals you know a lot about herself in order to uh help or save the person that she's talking with um but i know what you mean about the you know seeing people out of context like seeing your therapist on the street or I remember when I was a kid, I went to Catholic school and I remember one time during lunch, seeing my teacher who was a nun eat a sandwich Mm. and I was blown away. (laughs) What? You eat? (laughs) It's true. You never see him eat. They never eat. I saw Pastor Jerry. I was raised Lutheran. Uh, Pastor Jerry at the mall and he's wearing desert boots. And I go, Pastor Jerry wears desert boots? Because those were very cool. Back in yeah. the days, you know, I saw a rabbi on a pogo stick and I was like, what are you? You're never on that. Um, <laughs> right. I know. You know, Steve, I'm looking at this. There's so much Dana about Steve that we love because he's a. Uh, oh, actually, one more question about the movie yes. before I get into your illustrious. I, I have a question about so. the movie, too. OK, <laughs> my last one is being a well-known actor and a name. And uh, I don't want to hype you up too bad, but, you know, you direct and you're. Uh, well liked guy out there. Is it still hard to get a small movie off the ground? Yes, 
This is the first film I've directed in 15 years. Um, and there were others along the way that I tried to do. This one was, you know, hard to get off the ground as well. We, um, But yeah, I think the climate out there is tough for any filmmaker. Um, but, you know, but uh, where there's a will, there's a way. And we did it. You got through it. Yeah. yeah. Single, hard to single do. location I, helps with the budget. Yeah. And were you like, I was just at, for, as a, you're making your film, first film in a long time. And now it's, it's, it's digital, digital playback. And you're going, you get six days. And so you're with your DP or your producer or whatever, and you're looking at stuff. And are you going at some point, holy shit, this is awesome. Or you're being self-critical or I just wonder what you want us uh, who will enjoy the movie. What do you, what did you want us to feel? What were you trying to reach for? And do you feel that you got it? Yeah, I just, I wanted to create this really intimate atmosphere and have Tessa's, uh, the location be totally her, her world where you're getting clues about her um, and and for the, the audience to want to lean in and 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 be involved. And it is exciting that on set, um, it's also overwhelming because there's so much uh, dialogue in it. And uh, so I'm constantly thinking, you know, I, I try not to think of the editing process while I'm doing it but yeah i mean uh, that's things that you have to think about uh and is it is there enough movement is there is you know when should it be still when you know when or if the camera should should move when should tessa get up and move around and mm -hmm. um so we spent a lot of time actually working that stuff out before we before we shot it did you ever once on the set after a take just go what are you doing <laughs> and like Sandler, yeah. you sound like Sandler. <laughs>
they were dragging wow. me to the valley back and forth going do it like this you monkey and then uh they go no we got our guy thanks bye <laughs> i never knew that wow you would have been great. i have a steve when's the last time you auditioned for a movie yeah good one. Oh wow it's been a while i i yeah, I remember auditioning for a movie and then reading, you know, reading one of the parts and then asking the casting director, can I read for the lead? I was like, well, I, you know, <laughs> and and she looked at me and she said, oh, no, we're going to get a name for that. And that's the first time I ever heard that expression. We're going to get a name for that. Like, well, I have a name. And then I thought, oh, I see. I have to get my name known. I didn't know it worked that way. I just thought if you were. Oh, it's so many things I auditioned for were <laughs> offers out to people. And I was jumping around to kill time to scare them. Like we're having auditions right now. I mean, no one, no one's good yet. Don't worry. No one's good yet. <laughs> I hated when you walked into an audition room and I saw all these, this is in the eighties, baby face men with no chins. Like I go, okay, I get it. Oh, I, I, I get the memo. Oh, that's your look. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They're all lookalikes of me. No chin baby face. Okay. Cherubic. I get it. But they, I, I was over 150 at one point, 150 <laughs> auditions. <laughs> I've got, one time the agent called me, you didn't get it and you frightened them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I remember auditioning for Barry Levinson once and reading, you know, reading this part and he liked it. He went, that was good. It was good. Now can you do it? And he gave me a very specific direction. Mm. Did it again. Exactly the same. <laughs> and we both looked at each other. <laughs> I was mortified. He was embarrassed. And I, and I said, eh, that wasn't that different, was it? He went, no, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It, you know, can't take some, direction. <laughs> my fucking acting coach shocked. Yes, I had one. They said they might give you direction just to see if you can take direction. A lot of people can't. I'm like, why not? And they're like, it's shocking. They can't. They go, Steve Buscemi. They just start listing people. <laughs> but honestly, it's like you just say that and you go, oh, I would just change it. And some people are coached so hard yeah. or they're with their teacher or whatever. And they go, this is the right way to do it. Even to the director, they're like, I've got the right way. You don't. Right. And, and they're just testing you. But. I've done that. I bomb every every commercial audition, even more embarrassing. Um, do do the Cohen brothers give you a line by line reading? Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, like say the line like that, or how are they? They, you know, I, their writing is so specific, you know, that they really want you to, you know, say what's written. And so there's very little. I think I improvised something once on Fargo, and I was nervous about it, but they liked it. But I remember in the beginning when I first started working with them, they, uh, I think in Miller's Crossing, the, uh, they just wanted my character to be even, you know, he, he was a fast, he was the fastest talker that I think I ever. <laughs> it's hard with lines to do fast Mink, talking. Yeah. And they just wanted it even more. Like they just wanted it more intense or more shrill. And um, I remember doing the scene where I, you know, all I do is talk, 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 talk. Gabriel Byrne had like two words. Then I talk, 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 talk. He would just wait till I stopped talking. And then he would say two, two words. And there was a whole casino of people behind me uh, on my co coverage. And I remember on one of the takes, my late wife, Joe, she came to visit me on set, but I didn't know she was there yet. And as I'm doing the dialogue with the whole casino, you know, extras behind me, I see her head poke out you know, behind somebody to watch. And I just stopped talking. <laughs> oh, it threw you. Yeah. And then, all right, back to one, you know, and it would be a lot of rumbling <laughs> and she felt horrible. I could see the look on her face. She knew what happened and she just ducked it back out. Um, yeah. Cause your brain just switches. You go, wait, just, I was like, Oh, Joe. Turn, yeah. Turns you off. <laughs> you know, uh, it, Dana, I don't know if you remember this one. Of course you do. I don't know who you played in this. Maybe Travolta. The, one of my favorite sketches was Welcome Back, Cotter. Quentin yeah. Tarantino's Welcome Back, Cotter. When uh, John 
hosted when John. Oh, was John was playing John. Okay. John and- Travolta hosted, and it was Welcome Back, Cotter, directed by Quentin Tarantino. Mm-hmm. And um, at the end of it, yeah, because Michael McKeon was on the show, and they had Lenny and Squiggy pop out. Remember? And then I came out at the very end as Mr. Pink and said something like, up your hole with a jelly roll. Something like that. And <laughs> I, remember, I remember in the rehearsal, uh, or the dress, re- the dress re- rehearsal show, uh, I was late getting out there. And I didn't think it was my fault. I thought I was cued late. But you probably don't remember this, David, but afterwards, you did give me a little shit about that. Shut the fuck up, did I? You gave me a little me? bit. A little bit. You did. You did. You were like, hey, the, you know, Johnny on the spot there. What happened? Something like that. And I went, oh they didn't God. kill me. You know, <laughs> how dare I? I was try- I was nervous, nervous. I was horse shack and I was in character. Mr. Yeah. Cotter. <laughs> <laughs> I got to play horse shack. The- I loved it. I thought that was such a funny idea, funny sketch. It was great. Yeah. One of my all-time memorable ones. That's fun. You got to be in that, and um, I just watched your monologue of, of character actors. That was a good idea. You were uh, people in the audience, cast members were character actors, yeah. asking you how to be a lead. Wait, Do you remember this monologue? Yeah, they said like, "Hey, you're a lead, but you play a lot of character actors, but now you're a leading right. man." I play the girl with all the bags at a store that's the best friend. And then she frat falls out of frame. And then Kristen Wiig is like, I'm the girl running from the killer with a knife, but I don't know where anyone is. Steve, are you here? So everyone was playing a character and they were asking for your advice to get past being a character actor. I thought it was pretty clever. I thought that was good. I, that was good. I should watch that again because I totally blanked that out. I'll send you a link. Thanks. <laughs> All right, let me ask you a question. So, <laughs> but now that you say it, now that you anyway. describe it, I do, I do remember it. Yeah. I mean, it is a blur because you've got thirteen sketches you've hosted. I think twice. Twice. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. So it's hard to remember every nook and cranny, but it was a good job. I thought that was interesting. I, I like what I remembered about the first time hosting. During the dress rehearsal. I came out to do the monologue and I spotted a friend of mine from high school sitting in the front row. And again, it was just like seeing, (laughs) seeing my wife on set. I looked at him and I was like, Hey, it's Eddie. And I was like, ah, fuck. What's my, like, I don't know what to do now. (laughs) Mm -hmm. On top of your nerves. You see that throws you off. So scary. One take. That's the hard part. I know. You're like, let me start over. Nope. But thank God it was the dress rehearsal. And then at the, for the show, I just went, just told myself, just don't look at anybody. Just avoid eye eye contact. Yeah. Yeah. So what a run you had in the nineties. I mean, it come and then the SNL calls, you'd been in at least five giant movies, Reservoir Dogs, Pulp Fiction. Um, When did Fargo come out? Yeah, that came out like in 96. I was surprised that I got the call for it because I didn't, think i had really done enough to like warrant me being like that people would even know me uh but john tatura was also on that year and i thought oh is this the year that they're like going after uh independent film mm-hmm. actors or something and I, I was like i'm so thrilled to like get it but i was nervous that uh i think i suggested because in the opening monologue it was some monologue about my name, Steve, and something, you know, it was, and it just wasn't me. And I was nervous about that. So I sort of addressed that. And then I suggested something. I can't remember who came up with the idea that we were going to, like, I was going to take suggestions from the audience and do like an improv with the rest of the cast. And then I would just insert scenes from movies that I was in. But part of, but the ulterior motive was, to like to remind people I was in Fargo or Reservoir Dogs. <laughs> nervous that people wouldn't know, like, well, who was this guy? Um, but I was glad that they changed it. I was very sort of shy to say, can we, do I have to do this opening monologue? Can, there, can, can, can we change it? And uh and Lauren was really open to it and and receptive. And but that first time you host, it's just it's just so uh mind 
boggling. I was so anxious and I didn't know if I was allowed to say anything or contribute. And mm. even though they were asking me, like, is there anything that you like to do? Or do you have any special talents? Can you sing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, oh, whatever you want. Yeah. <laughs> right. Do you feel uh, like you're being a problem if you say too much on a set? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. then also like, what do I know? Like, aren't like, you're the experts. <laughs> yeah. You put yourself in their hands. I think yeah. they just test you to say, we have a sketch we've been sitting on, but we need someone that can speak Russian or we need someone that can, you know, sing and they, they and, yeah. and yeah, and you need just dialects and weird shit and you go, I can juggle. They go, okay, we can put that in something. And then right. that helps. Did, did Lorne calm me down or is he sort of imposing in his own way? But normally he would really take a host. You go to dinner with him. You'll be nervous on the dress rehearsal and, and then on air, it'll all just come together. That's okay. yeah. He's kind of both. He's very <laughs> intimidating and comforting at the same, you know, kind of at the same time. Cause he's so, calm you know that it, like and it's no this is what we do and you'll be fine and it's mm -hmm. like okay i'll believe you <laughs> do you you know we had a an old movie you did was called airheads i saw it again on the, on the flight because we had lovely brendan fraser who was a super wow. sweetheart uh mm -hmm. he's great and then uh of course sandler for seeing airheads again because i went and saw it on uh broadway and like 69th wherever there's that little theater in new york during i think it was snl and it, i saw the whole thing again pretty fun yeah. to see the whole thing again um and billy madison of course is such a big one and that people remember you from uh, you I know did, i such did a one day on that movie on and movie. everyone remembers it is that you when you cross the the list of kill who to kill that thing and then yeah yeah the, so I, memorable <laughs> he he calls me up and he apologizes for his bullying behavior in high school and then i cross his name off the list of people, people to kill and to kill and then i for no reason at all i just put on lipstick which <laughs> that was my favorite part <laughs> you know we went do you think i mean we went yeah, being the character actor is great <laughs> we saw I mean, sandler tape his thing i thought i might see that he's doing his uh stand-up special know, I know. and uh bridget was there yeah Veronica Vaughn, mm. the teacher in Billy Madison. And uh, oh. and I said, you get to be for history in one of Farley's funniest things, oh, saying man. that Veronica Vaughn is one fine piece of ace. And then Billy <laughs> goes, so you weren't with her. And he goes, I had a couple fun nights with her. And he goes, no, you didn't. And he goes, ah, no, I didn't. Or whatever he says, it's so funny. It's very, 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 very Chris. <laughs> yeah, it was like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he <laughs> plays the bus that... driver in Billy Madison. Yeah. So funny. Yeah, yeah, that's fun. It's fun to be a part of even like that one scene you did. Just from everyone remembers. It. I loved, and you know, yeah. And Chris was in Airheads, and I remember when we did the read through, and afterwards, Chris said to me. <laughs> <laughs> there's a part in their heads where you know like my character gets angry and i'm like yelling at adam and and uh chris says to me wow steve when you were yelling that one time you, you sounded just like you did in reservoir dogs and i kind of looked at him like what are you saying and i realized <laughs> chris really was that way like when he had that sketch on snl yeah he was, oh god what you know remember when you were in the beatles yeah 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 he really was that way kind of <laughs> But he was excited, I'm sure, to see you. I know, it, I know. Yeah, it's fun. And, and I just, you know, and and I kind of looked at him and he looked at, at me and and then we like just laughed. But uh, it was a really funny thing from the start. Yeah, he's a, he is a sweetheart. Was Fargo the one you get asked about the most? Only because it won Best Picture, right? It was No, it's uh, The Big Lebowski. Oh, okay. And, and, took, and that was another. And it took a few years for that to happen. Um, because that was the one that followed Fargo. And mm -hmm. I think critics and like didn't know what to make of it at, at the time. And it kind of fell through the cracks. But then like five years later, I would start to get these like college kids come up to me mm -hmm. and mention it because they watched it on VHS like over and over. And then in 10 years time, it, then it was, yeah. And then I, it got to be where I knew the Lebowski fans, like, Somebody would come up to me on the street and they'd be about to say something. And I'd say, shut the fuck up, Donnie. 
And they'd like look at me like, oh, yeah, oh, wow, it is you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> God, I, I'm telling you, I hear about that. Like people, I'm not in it, but people go, God, have you seen the big Lebowski? Oh, like the one of my, when they mm -hmm. listing movies they like and comedies and it just really did resonate. Yeah. Hey, I'm the dude, man. Jeff Bridges is such there a stud. Did. Such a stud. <laughs> Jeff Bridges, I always say that when he became a cowboy actor, he always sounded like he just had a hoagie. <laughs> I'm going to do a take here in a minute, but I just had a big deep fried <laughs> sandwich. Yeah. He, you know, he, A, his, Jeff now, if he listens to our podcast, he just, once he did True, true Grit, and then he yeah. just stayed. His voice got gravelier. Well, he's just sort of, he went post acting. I think some people, if you see Hell or High Water, He's being so playful in that it's almost like Anthony Hopkins in the one he got the Oscar for a couple of years ago. So kind of like beyond acting, they're just playing. I, I don't know what to describe. He's like, let's get a giddy up on this car. You, I, I don't know. In the hell or high water, I went, oh, he jumped the shark. He's not acting anymore. Do you know what I mean? Just Steve, in a way? Yes. He's just become whatever. Yeah. It, you know, mm -hmm. he's just, yeah, he just. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, rules are out When's the, the window. most in the pocket you feel you've ever been like in a role like, OK, this is the most I'm not thinking that I'm acting in a way or I'm just feeling so, so great in each take. If it ever. Happened. Well, no. <laughs> um, I mean, the first feature that I directed, Trees Lounge, was a character that I wrote for myself that kind of was. Uh, like an exaggerated version of me, but it was me. And, and um, so, but it was weird because I was also directing it and I always get very anxious when I direct. So it was hard to really enjoy it, you know, fully in the moment. If somebody else mm -hmm. was directing, I think I, maybe I would have felt like, Oh yeah, I'm nail on this. Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise I'm just like, I'm just thinking about the rest of the day and just wanting to get through a scene, make sure I got it right. But yeah, uh, but my anxiety, I think, just gets in the way. Wait a minute, an actor with anxiety? I mean, in, in self, and in self, you're, you're telling me a brilliant actor has self doubt and anxiety, yeah. except for Brando, maybe. I don't know. But everybody else was a little shaky. I don't know. Hard to, hard to place Brando. I'll bet he was insecure. Brando. No. Well, he got the earpiece at some point. So I think he <laughs> was you, like, I'm sick of memorizing lines. It's too <laughs> stressful. Not giving a fuck is, is another way to do this. Thing, <laughs> yeah. you know? No, I'm saying the word anxiety. I didn't know growing up or I would have said it every day, but I think now that you give people this word, like yeah. kids, they're like, I'm anxious at school. I'm like, well, no fuck. I've been anxious since the day I was born till right now. Like it's a very rough life out there. And, they're like, I don't want to do my homework. It gives me anxiety. No shit. Like everything does. Oh, I had panic attacks before I do stand up, but I didn't know I was having a panic yeah, attack. Yeah, you don't know what it's called. You're just like, I was. So I'd give it out. a name and then I'd have to go talk to a therapist for $225 an hour. Maybe you talk her down to $200. Oh, well, that's enough <laughs> personal information. For tip. But uh, <laughs> yeah, everybody is anxious now and, and depressed. Steve? True. We can now. Now we know what we are. <laughs> we know we're screwed up and we have vocabulary. Before I let you go, Steve, because you're a wonderful guy. I, I And you're doing 12 other podcasts after this no. for the listener. You know, the good thing about Steve is he's not totally out there on everything. Like, that's the interesting mystery of Buscemi. He's just kind of cool, lays back a little bit, doesn't smother up. He, I don't, it's, I think it's uh, unintentional, but yeah, he's effortlessly cool. And the fact that you, I mean, I'll just throw this out here because I don't, it's not common knowledge to everybody that you were a firefighter who dreamed of becoming an actor, yeah. who became an actor, 9-11 happens, and then you apparently volunteer and you're going into the rubble with the firefighters, not to bring up such a dark subject, but that's an extraordinary uh, thing a, a, for a human being to have done, you know? Well, thank you. No, cool. yeah, because I, I, mean, I was a firefighter for a few years in the early 80s. And then, you know, as the years went by, I got further and further away from it and lost touch. But then 9-11, yeah, it just put me back in touch. Mm -hmm. And I felt really honored that they would even let me come back sure. and work with them, with my uh, my company, Engine 55. And I, I had access 
Uh, but I know so many people who would have done the same thing that wanted to be there, but just was couldn't get in there. And and I had I had the opportunity and the access because I used to be on the job, and I felt very honored to you know that that I was that I was able to do that. It's hard for any of us to imagine mm-hmm. that scene and what what you went through. And you were invisible in a sense with the gear and everything. No one. No, hey, that's the Fargo guy. You know what's weird is that you know I still had my uh, my turnout coat and my helmet and boots, and so I went there thinking that I would that I could blend in. But I had been off the job like since the mid '80s, and all the and all the equipment changed and the bunker gear. <laughs> you look like so, Curious George or something. So I kind of stood out anyway, and then oh, so people were like kind of looking at me like. Who, why who is this guy why doesn't he have like why is from a he time machine a relic from the past <laughs> oh wait a minute it's that guy it's that actor yeah you know dana oh, that's funny he did that anonymously and he he helped for uh at weeks in a related story i brought cookies down and and had tipped off tmz to follow me and then later <laughs> And I was in full makeup. And then, hey man, you both, yeah. you both are heroes. And I sent <laughs> them a bill. They're, you're different kinds of heroes. I want to ask Steve a question because I don't know if this is true either. Because <laughs> I was a pip. David and I were pip squeaks in high school. Like I, I graduated. I was probably 125. Me too. But I, I heard you wrestled at 105 <laughs> on the varsity. Oh really? But you got bigger than that, right? Were you that a freshman, 105? Or? I know. I did that up until my senior year. Maybe I went up another 105? I don't think so. 105? Yeah. That's crazy. I know. Were you your height? Of- I, but because I, I was pretty wiry and I was pretty uh, strong for my weight. I did pretty good during the year, uh, you know, like in the, in the team matches. But then in the tournaments, I always... I always choked. When you started wrestling guys, was it harder? <laughs> he says the girls a little easier. And then they started putting me up against guys. When yeah. I got to 110. And then it was two girls versus Steve. And he, he'd take them down three girls and it was getting hard. And then they had a 87 pound uh, guy. <laughs> no, but you were good. I mean, you were actually, you would seem like the kind of guy who would be good at wrestling. I don't know why I think that. But yeah, your intellect and kind of, I think wiry people are secretly strong. I was, I was okay. I did, I, you know, I had, I had a great coach, Mr. Earl and, and, uh, and uh, his son, Richie Earl was my wrestling partner. So, and like, he was like the best on the team. So it kind of rubbed off on, on me. I had one secret move called the reverse cradle. (laughs) And if I got you in it, if I got you in the reverse cradle, Uh-oh. you know, it was like a surprise. And I actually beat some like guys who were probably better than me. But then, you know, that, that's why I would choke in the tournaments because then you wrestle these same people again. Oh, and they're on to be the old and they know you're cradle. A one trick. Pony. It always seemed a little close quartery in a way. Did you ever, you ever wrestling a guy and all of a sudden your face was right up against his junk and you're going, why am I doing yeah. this? It's very homoerotic <laughs> wrestling. It is. Okay. It, you know, it, Let's look at a clip. It. It's part of the appeal. It's part of, <laughs> it's part of the appeal. <laughs> it does get a diverse audience. Yes. Yes. That's good. Yeah. All right, Dana, what do we do with uh, Steve? We let him go. Well, we could do ours because of uh, he doesn't need our help. But yeah, he's Steve Buscemi. Yep. He's a national treasure. Mm-hmm. I'm going to use that <laughs> as a because you've just been around so long. And uh, if I see one in a movie, I'm just happy. <laughs> oh. yeah, you're like this guy. It's this guy. And I think when you are in your lane, um, I, I don't know who your peers are. I don't know if it's Christopher Walken. These are older people. But um it's there's the cool factor. You're not in. You're not a pretty boy in front of a movie doing all the press. You're just the guy who goes in and you can't take your eyes off that guy. You know. I mean, it's like you weren't in Fargo. It was like it didn't feel like you were acting. Uh, you weren't a, an actor in that movie. They're like they got a real guy to do this. <laughs> they got where'd they get this? I had that once with Rip Torn. I saw a movie. Thought where'd they get this guy off the street? He was so good in this movie. And I think you have that vibe about you. Thank you. So I'm not a pretty boy. That's what you're saying. 
Well, no. I'm saying you're you're ruggedly handsome. I <laughs> thank you. That, thank you. I appreciate. Do you think David's a pretty no, boy? I, uh, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Look thank you. I've gotten away with uh, every time I date someone, it's Beauty and the Beast in every article. I'm like, I, I, enough for this. Like, just <laughs> why not <laughs> just say you I'm don't okay? Look like a beast. They say they go yuck. That's like exclamation is the headline. I'm like, all right. You can't do that. You can't do that with the girls. You can't say. Look at this great looking guy with his dog. It's like, you can't. You can do it with me. All right, Steve, that's really what I wanted to get off my chest. Okay. Thank you, um, thank you for talking to us. Uh, you're a stud, and uh, we'll talk soon, hopefully. Thank you Enjoy both. It. I love you both, and thank you We so love much. you. We hope we see you. Thank you. Okay, see you, bug. This has been a presentation of Odyssey. Please follow, subscribe, leave a like, a review, all the stuff, smash that button, whatever it is, wherever you get your podcasts. Fly on the Wall is executive produced by Dana Carvey and David Spade, Jenna Weiss Berman of Odyssey, Charlie Finan of Brillstein Entertainment, and Heather Santoro. The show's lead producer is Greg Holtzman.